Hello, I think I'm live now. With my incredibly good background where you can see something plugged into a thing and a little hair clip holding the curtain across. It's actually very professional. It's ironic. Um, back into it, Marjorie Camp. I think that last time... Last time Marjorie was looking for, um, not really looking for uh, bishops and archbishops and that to kind of legitimize her visions and stuff, which you really, really need if you're going to go around saying Jesus speaks to you in the Middle Ages, um, because otherwise you are going to be called a heretic and burned alive, which was a very real possibility for Marjorie at that time. Um, I think it's quite easy to forget when you're reading that, yeah, if she'd made the the wrong friends or the right enemies, uh, she would absolutely have been killed. Just for saying that she had visions of God. Not even saying anything particularly heretical, just... I'm God and I love you, Marjorie Camp. Um, that is absolutely enough to get you killed in the Middle Ages. So, getting the support of the Bishop of Norwich was pretty important, but she didn't. Uh, he wouldn't commit himself and he sent her on to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's his boss. Uh, also, Marjorie's been told to wear white clothes all the time. And the bishop has given her some money to buy clothes with, which is kind of an endorsement, but not really. Not really enough to keep her safe. Uh, oh, and also previously, in, um, in a very funny move, Jesus told Marjorie uh, not to sleep with her husband and not to eat with him on a Friday to fast. And Marjorie's husband eventually, he, he didn't really agree to the um, to the chastity angle. And he eventually got so sick of not eating with her on a Friday that he agreed to swap it. And Marjorie said to Jesus, oh, is it okay if, if I eat dinner with my husband on Fridays now? And Jesus said to her, I only told you to do that so that you would get the chastity thing now. Very cunning. And uh, Marjorie's husband was great about it. He said, may God have as free a use of your body as I have had. Which is hilarious and very sarcastic. But he's still supporting her. Um, they don't really go into their relationship a lot. But when you think about the kind of danger Marjorie was in, it was such a good line. And she did not seem to understand the irony at all. She's like, oh, thanks very much. Amazing. But yeah, when you think about that kind of danger and the fact that he backed her in it, he does seem a little bit reluctant, but knowing what was on the line, not only her life, but his life and the lives of however many of their 14 children had been born at that point, you know, you, you can see why he was a little bit leery. So, at this point, Marjorie has left the Bishop of Norwich, who would not commit, and she's going to the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, chapter 16. Then this creature went on to London with her husband, to Lambeth, where the Archbishop was in residence at that time. As they came into the hall in the afternoon, there were many of the Archbishop's clerks about, and other heedless men, both squires and yeomen, who swore many great oaths and spoke many thoughtless words. And this creature boldly rebuked them and said they would be damned unless they left off their swearing and the other sins they practised. And with that there came forward a woman of that town dressed in a pilch, I do not know what this means, who reviled this creature, cursed her, and said very maliciously to her in this way, I wish you were in Smithfield and I would bring a bundle of sticks to burn you with. It is a pity that you are alive. Smithfield being where they would burn 
uh, heretics. This creature stood still and did not answer, and her husband endured it with great pain and was very sorry to hear his wife so rebuked. And it, these aren't just idle words. There's a very real possibility of uh, Marjorie getting burnt alive and this woman who's dressed up like a pilchard or whatever is going on, uh, chucking some shit on the fire and clapping and so on. Then the archbishop sent for this creature to come to him in his garden. When she came into his presence, she made her obeisances, obeisances to him as best she could, praying him out of his gracious lordship to grant her authority to choose her confessor and to receive communion every Sunday, if God would dispose her to this, under his letter and his seal throughout all his province. Very unusual to choose your own confessor, very unusual to take communion every Sunday for a laywoman. And he granted her with great kindness her whole desire without any silver or gold, nor would he let his clerks take anything for the writing or sealing of the letter. And as we all know from Blackadder, uh, people not taking any gold or silver for uh, religious duties, even people who live in a palace, very unusual. I don't have any Diet Coke today. I have a can of Lacroix that Maddie gave me from her car and I put it in my fridge and I forgot about it. Lacroix that you got out of a car and then put in the fridge and forgot about and now you have it. The official sponsor of whatever it is we're doing here. When this creature found this grace in his sight, she was much comforted and strengthened in her soul. And so she told this worshipful Lord about her manner of life and such grace as God brought in her mind and in her soul in order to discover what he would say about it and if he found any fault with either her contemplation or her weeping. And she also told him the cause of her weeping and the manner in which our Lord conversed with her soul. And he did not find fault at all, but approved her manner of life and was very glad that our merciful Lord Christ Jesus showed such grace in our times. Blessed may he be. She's getting away with a lot. Then this creature spoke to him boldly about the correction of his household, saying with reverence, My Lord, our Lord of all, almighty God, has not given you your benefice and great worldly wealth in order to maintain those who are traitors to him and those who slay him every day by the swearing of great oaths. You shall answer for them unless you correct them or else put them out of your service. In the most meek and kindly way, he allowed her to say what was on her mind and gave her a handsome answer, she supposing that things would then be better. And so their conversation continued until stars appeared in the sky. Then she took her leave and her husband too. Yeah, it's, um, it's an interactive podcast or telephone call, as we used to call them. Um. But yeah, these guys are all running around the Archbishop's house saying, oh, by God's face, which was a pretty bad swear word at the time. Marjorie's telling them off, these rowdy teens, um, swearing by God's body parts was a big deal in the Middle Ages, uh, saying the rude words, uh, the rude four-letter words that we do these days wasn't a big deal. They were just words. <laughs> but swearing by God's face yeah you you could swear by all kinds of things um which is where we get the word swearing to swear an oath but now it's swear words it's all different now you could swear by God's knees by God's ears um by God's blood that was a big one. Oh, Marjorie yeah she wanted to talk to everybody's manager to express the fact that she had spoken to the CEO, Jesus, <laughs> and registered her complaints. Um, swearing by God's body, that was a big one. That's why Captain Hook says stuff like odds bodikins, which was a um, like a funny way of saying by God's body. By God's ass, yeah. Great and fearful oaths they swore. Uh, so that's that's what these guys are swearing. Um, but those were the swear words of the time. 
Afterwards, they went back to London and many worthy men wanted to hear her converse. Her conversation was so much to do with the love of God that those who heard it were often moved to weep very sadly. And when you consider that a lot of priests talked a lot about uh, God's fearful hatred for everybody and uh, how much hell was really a terrible place to be and how you should give a ton of money to the church, probably hearing Marjorie talk about how God actually loves you was quite a relief, I would imagine. And so she had a very warm welcome there and her husband because of her for as long as they wished to stay in the city. Afterwards, they returned to Lynn, Bishop's Lynn, now King's Lynn, I think. Then this creature went to the anchorite at the preaching friars in Lynn and told him how she had been received and how she had got on while she was traveling around the country. And he was very pleased at her homecoming and held it to be a great miracle, her coming and going to and fro. And he said to her, I have heard much evil talk of you since you went away, and I have been strongly advised to leave you and not to associate with you any more. and great friendships have promised me on condition that I give you up. And I answered for you in this way, if you were still the same as you were when we parted, I certainly dared say that you were a good woman, a lover of God, and highly inspired with the Holy Ghost. I will not forsake her for any lady in this realm, if speaking with the lady means leaving her. For I would rather leave the lady and speak with Marjorie, if I might not do both, than do the contrary. Basically, the haters and the fake friends, as soon as Marjorie's gone out of town, they are trying to get all of her friends to stop talking to her. Very shameful. And also, as I've really hammered home in this video, there is a, such a real danger of absolute fiery death. Good to keep in mind. Chapter 17. We jump around in time a little bit because Marjorie is um, a free spirit in narrating. It just tells you things as they occur to her, which makes her even more real to me. Uh, okay, chapter 17. One day, long before this time, while this creature was bearing children and was newly delivered of a child, our Lord Christ Jesus said to her that she should bear no more children, and therefore he commanded her to go to Norwich. And she said, oh, dear Lord, how shall I go? I am feeling faint and weak. Don't be afraid. I shall make you strong enough. I bid you go to the vicar of St. Stephen's and say that I greet him warmly and that he is a high chosen soul of mine and tell him he greatly pleases me with his preaching and tell him the secrets of your soul and my counsels that I reveal to you. Then she made her way to Norwich and came into his church on a Thursday a little before noon. And the vicar was walking up and down with another priest who was his confessor and who was still alive when this book was written. And this creature was dressed in black clothing at that time. The white clothing. We, we know. We all know. We remember the white clothes. She greeted the vicar, asking him if she could, in the afternoon when he had eaten, speak with him for an hour or two for the love of God. He, lifting up his hands and blessing himself, said, Bless us! How could a woman occupy one or two hours with the love of our Lord? I shan't eat a thing till I find out what you can say of our Lord God in the space of an hour. Yep, women be talking, but not about God. Then he sat himself down in the church. She, sitting a little to one side, told him all the words which God had revealed to her in her soul. Afterwards, she told him the whole manner of her life from her childhood, as closely as it would come to mind. How unkind and unnatural she had been towards our Lord Jesus Christ how proud and vain she had been in her bearing, how obstinate against the laws of God, and how envious towards her fellow Christians, how she was chastised, later, when it pleased our Lord Christ Jesus, with many tribulations and horrible temptations, and how afterwards she was fed and comforted with holy meditations, and especially in the memory of our Lord's passion. And, you know, quick reminder that passion in this context means, you know, the, the suffering and death of saints but especially of Jesus. Oh, right, the passion of the Christ. We know this already. Sorry. And while she conversed on the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, she heard so terrible a melody that she could not bear it. Then this creature fell down as if she had lost her bodily strength and lay still for a long while, desiring to put it aside, and she could not. Then she knew indeed by her faith that there was great joy in heaven, 
where the least point of bliss surpasses without any comparison all the joy that might ever be thought or felt in this life. She was greatly strengthened in her faith, and the more bold to tell the vicar her feelings, which she had by revelations about both the living and the dead, and about his own self. Not sure what's going on with the... Yeah, the passion of the poster, absolutely. Yet I will post. I'm not, I don't really know what's going on with the, the terrible song that she heard that made her lie down and couldn't get up for a little while. Maybe it was Justin Bieber or whoever we talk about this year because that reference is kind of at least a decade old. It's so hot. I'm losing my mind, honestly. She told him how sometimes the Father of Heaven conversed with her soul as plainly and as certainly as one friend speaks to another through bodily speech. Sometimes the second person in the Trinity, sometimes all three persons in Trinity and one substance in Godhead spoke to her soul and informed her in her faith and in his love, how she should love him, worship him and dread him so excellently that she neither heard any book, neither Hilton's book nor Breed's book, nor Stimulus Amoris, nor Incendium Amoris, nor any other book that she ever heard read that spoke so exaltedly of the love of God as she felt highly working in her soul if she could have communicated what she felt. And these are all really well-known um, medieval books by you know, various saints and mystics about, uh, about how nice God is. Uh, she, she never heard any book. Because as we remember, Marjorie couldn't read or write. Um, and that's why she's dictating all of this to the priest. Sometimes Our Lady spoke to her mind. Sometimes St. Peter. Sometimes St. Paul. Sometimes St. Catherine. Or whatever saint in heaven she was devoted to. Appeared to her soul and taught how she should love our Lord and how she should please him. These conversations were so sweet, so holy and so devout. That often this creature could not bear it but fell down and twisted and wrenched her body about and made remarkable faces and gestures with vehement sobbings and great abundance of tears, sometimes saying, Jesus, mercy, and sometimes I die. Doesn't sound particularly spiritual to me, but uh, get yours, Marjorie. And therefore, I'm just like these, these dumbass people who don't, who don't get it. And therefore many people slandered her, not believing that it was the work of God, but that some evil spirit tormented her in her body or else that she had some bodily sickness. Notwithstanding the protests and resentments of people against her, this holy man, vicar of St. Stephen's Church at Norwich, whom God had exalted and through marvellous works had shown and proved to be holy, he always took her side and supported her against her enemies as much as he could after the time when she, at God's command, had told him about her manner of life and behaviour. For he faithfully believed that she was learned in the law of God, and endued with the grace of the Holy Ghost, to whom it belongs to inspire where he will. And though his voice be heard, it is not known in this world whence it comes, or whither it goes. You don't often hear about the Holy Ghost talking to people. I think it's because it's nebulous. Like a big holy cloud. This holy vicar, after this time, was always confessor to this creature when she came to Norwich and gave her communion with his own hands. And when, on one occasion, she was admonished to appear before certain officers of the bishop to answer certain charges that would be made against her through the agitation of envious people, the good vicar, preferring the love of God above any shame in this world, went with her to hear her examination and delivered her from the malice of her enemies. And then it was revealed to this creature that the good vicar would live for seven more years after this and then he would pass hence with great grace. And so he did as she had foreseen. <laughs> yeah, the... <laughs> okay, I love this idea of the Holy Ghost as um, like a Grandpa Simpson type figure. There's like the father, the son and the Grandpa Simpson just tells you really long stories about like the Triassic period but he leaves out all the dinosaurs and you gotta listen because it's polite and he's also God oh Marjorie you went through so much and also 
as I've talked about a lot here, Marjorie being examined by the bishop uh, is for heresy. It's not the kind of thing where if you pass, you get a gold star, and if you don't, you get to go home and say you tried. <clears throat> Sorry, I've got <sighs> my back hurts. Chapter 18. This creature was charged and commanded in her soul that she should go to a white friar in the same city of Norwich, who was called William Southfield, a good man who lived a holy life, to reveal to him the grace that God had wrought in her as she had done to the good vicar before. And um, as we've talked about before, white friars, just a different order of friars. I cannot remember which ones were the white um, habits. There were grey friars, black fire friars. The, the ones who wore brown were St. Francis. They were Franciscans. I think the Dominicans wore black. The Benedictines wore... I don't know. I don't know, but Wikipedia does. So... You can look it up yourself. <laughs> I keep forgetting to check. Um, she did as she was commanded and came to the friar one morning and was with him in a chapel for a long time and told him her meditations and what God had wrought in her soul in order to know if she were deceived by any delusions or not. This good man, the white friar, all the time that she told him of her feelings, held up his hands and said, Jesus, mercy, and thanks be to Jesus. Sister, he said, have no fear about your manner of life, for it is the Holy Ghost plentifully working his grace in your soul. Thank him highly of his goodness, for we are all bound to thank him for you, who now in our times inspires you with his grace, to the help and comfort of all of us who are supported by your prayers and by others such as you. And we are preserved from many misfortunes and troubles which we should deservedly suffer for our trespasses, were there not such good creatures among us. Blessed be Almighty God for his goodness. And therefore, sister, I advise you to dispose yourself to receive the gifts of God as lowly and meekly as you can and put up no obstacle or objections against the goodness of the Holy Ghost. For he may give his gifts where he will, and the unworthy he makes worthy, the sinful he makes righteous. His mercy is always ready for us, unless the fault be in ourselves, for he does not dwell in a body subject to sin. He flies from all false pretense and falsehood. He asks of us a low, a meek, and a contrite heart with a good will. Our Lord says himself, my spirit shall rest upon a meek man, a contrite man, and one who fears my words. Personally, I don't agree with this kind of theology, but um, I really don't like being told what to do by anybody. Sister, I trust to our Lord that you have these conditions either in your will or in your affections or else in both. And I do not consider that our Lord allows to be endlessly deceived those who place their trust in him and seek and desire nothing but him only, as I hope you do. And therefore believe fully that our Lord loves you and is working his grace in you. I pray God increase it and continue it to his everlasting worship for his mercy. The said creature was very much comforted both in body and in soul by this good man's words, and greatly strengthened in her faith. And then she was commanded by our Lord to go to an anchoress in the same city who was called Dame Julian. And this lady, Julian of Norwich, is... Uh, well, she's the mystic of this time that people tend to write about much more than Marjorie. Julian of Norwich features in. Uh, I mean, there are tons of books about her, and there are tons of historical novels that feature Julian. Not really. Yeah. Uh, Catholics are a bit alien to me. I've only been in a Catholic church a few times, and it was only for funerals, so... I might have a slightly warped idea of what goes on. I'm pretty sure there isn't always a coffin in there. Pretty sure. Statues are pretty cool, though. Um, yeah, so Julian of Norwich, and her book is also really good, but it's not... Um, it's more about, you know, God. Uh, it's less of a an autobiography the way Marjorie's book is because it has so many details about her and her husband and everything. But Julian Norwich did write one of the most comforting, I think, spiritual sentences in 
all of English literature. She wrote, all will, all will be well, and all will be well, and every manner of thing will be well. Something God told her, she wrote it down. It's very comforting. I do not believe it, but uh, I think she was probably a very nice lady. Uh, anyway, so crossover time. She's going to go and see Dame Julian. And so she did and told her about the grace that God had put into her soul of compunction, contrition, sweetness and devotion, compassion with holy meditation and high contemplation and very many holy speeches and converse that our Lord spoke to her soul and also many wonderful revelations which she described to the anchoress to find out if there were any deception in them for the anchoress was expert in such things and could give good advice. It's a lovely phrase, yeah. Uh, the anchoress, hearing the marvellous goodness of our Lord, highly thanked God with all her heart for his visitation, advising this creature to be obedient to the will of our Lord and fulfil with all her might whatever he put into her soul, if it were not against the worship of God and the prophet of her fellow Christians. For if it were, then it were not the influence of a good spirit, but rather of an evil spirit. The Holy Ghost never urges a thing against charity, and if he did, he would be contrary to his own self, for he is all charity. Also, he moves a soul to, ch to all chasteness, for chaste livers are called the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost makes a soul stable and steadfast in the right faith and the right belief. Mm, not into the chastity, really. And a double man and soul is always unstable and unsteadfast in all his ways. He that is forever doubting is like the wave of the sea, which is moved and borne about with the wind, and that man is not likely to receive the gifts of God. These are in little quotes. I assume this is Julian. Any creature that has these tokens may steadfastly believe that the Holy Ghost dwells in his soul. And much more, when God visits a creature with tears of contrition, devotion, or compassion, he may and ought to believe that the Holy Ghost is in his soul. St. Paul says that the Holy Ghost asks for us with mourning and weeping unspeakable. That is to say, he causes us to ask and pray with mourning and weeping so plentifully that the tears may not be numbered. No evil spirit may give these tokens. For St. Jerome says that tears torment the devil more than do the pains of hell. God and the devil are always at odds, and they shall never dwell together in one place, and the devil has no power in a man's soul. I think we just discovered um, uh, a way out of hell. Just cry a bunch. The devil will get sick of it, and he'll send you upstairs. That can't be right. That seems too easy. Holy Writ says that the soul of a righteous man is the seed of God, and so I trust, sister, that you are. I pray God grant you perseverance. Set all your trust in God and do not fear the talk of the world, for the more contempt, shame, and reproof that you have in this world, the more is your merit in the sight of God. Patience is necessary in you, for in that shall you keep your soul. Great was the holy conversation that the anchoress and this creature had through the talking of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ for the many days that they were together. This creature revealed her manner of life to many a worthy clerk, to honoured doctors of divinity, both religious men and others of secular habit. And they said that God wrought great grace in her and bade her not to be afraid. There was no delusion in her manner of living. They counselled her to be persevering, for their greatest fear was that she would turn aside and not keep her perfection. She had so many enemies and so much slander, and it seemed to them that she might not bear it without great grace and a mighty faith. And it's really important for Marjorie that these people do back her and that they're, she has a record of them backing her and saying that her visions did come from God, not from the devil, and there's just really no need to set fire to her. Others who had no knowledge of her manner of behaving, except through outward observations alone or else through the gossip of other people perverting the judgment of truth, spoke very badly of her and caused her to have much more enmity and distress than she would otherwise have done if it had not been for their evil talk. It is. Nevertheless, the anchorite of the preaching friars in Lynn, who was her principal confessor, as is written before, took the responsibility on his own soul that her feelings were good and sure, and that there was no deception in them. And this is a big deal for him as well, because uh, if she's proven to be a heretic, what does that say about the people who 
endorsed her. Everyone here is is it's a big deal <laughs> in, in a way we can't really understand in a secular society these days. Uh, and through the spirit of prophecy, he told her that when she went to Jerusalem, she would have a great deal of trouble with her maidservant and that our Lord would try her severely and test her very strictly. Then she replied, Ah, oh, good sir, what shall I do when I am far from home and in strange countries and my maidservant is against me? My physical comfort would then be all gone, and I would not know where to get spiritual comfort from any confessor such as you are. Daughter, don't be afraid, for our Lord will comfort you himself, whose comfort surpasses all others. And when your friends have forsaken you, our Lord shall cause a broken-backed man to escort you wherever you wish to go. And it happened just as the anchorite had prophesied, in every detail, and as, I trust, will be written more fully later on. Then this creature said to the anchorite in a kind of complaining way, Good sir, what shall I do? He that is my confessor in your absence is very sharp with me. He won't believe my feelings. He sets no store by them at all. He considers them merely trifles and jokes, and that is most painful for me, for I am very fond of him and will gladly follow his advice. He's a doubter and hater. The anchorite answering her says, said, It is no wonder, daughter, that he can't believe in your feelings so soon. He knows very well that you have been a sinful woman, and therefore he thinks that God would not be on terms of homely familiarity with you in so short a time. After your conversion, I would not for all this world be so sharp with you as he is. God, because of your deservingness, has appointed him to be your scourge, and he deals with you as a smith with a file makes the iron bright and clear to the sight, which before appeared rusty, dark, and nastily coloured. The sharper he is to you, the more clearly your soul shines in God's sight. And God has ordained me to be your spiritual fosterer and your comfort. Be humble and meek and thank God both for the one and the other. And honestly, that's what the haters and the trolls, that's what they do to me. They just make me shinier. Um, like you make a sword shiny so it can cut through all your haters. And for that reason, I thank them and also attack them with swords. That last bit was just me. On one occasion, before this creature went to her prayers to discover what answer she should give to the widow, she was commanded in her spirit to bid the widow leave her current confessor, if she would please God, and go to the anchorite at the preaching friars in Lynn and tell him all about her life. When this creature gave this me message, the widow would not believe her words, nor her confessor either, unless God would give her the same grace that he gave this creature, and she ordered this creature that she should not come to her place anymore. And because this creature told her that she had to feel love and affection for her confessor, therefore the widow said it would have been a good thing for this creature if her love and affection were directed as hers were. Obviously the widow asked Marjorie a question and uh, didn't like the answer that she got. Oh, these earrings are so cool. They make it look like I have brain worms that are coming out of my ears. And they're also cobras. Then our Lord commanded this creature to have a letter written and send it to her. A master of divinity wrote a letter at the request of this creature and sent it to the widow with the following clauses. One clause was that the widow should never have the grace that this creature had. Another was that Although this creature would never to come inside her house, it would greatly please God. Our Lord said again to this creature, It would be more profitable for her than this whole world if her love were fixed as yours is. And I command you to go to her confessor and tell him that, because he will not believe your words. They shall be separated without him noticing, and those who are not confided in by her shall know this before he does, whether he likes it or not. So, daughter, you may see here how hard it is to separate a man from his own will. And this whole series of events fell out indeed, as this creature had foretold, 12 years afterwards. Then this creature suffered a great deal of tribulation and unhappiness, because she said these words, as our Lord commanded her to. And she was always increasing in the love of God, and was bolder than she was before. So, yeah. Cool. $4. dollars Um... Essentially, Marjorie has a run-in with a hater. 
And uh, says, no, actually, actually, you're the one who sucks. Everything I do is good. And also, God has signed this. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to recap every chapter with. Okay, one more. Chapter 19. Before this creature went to Jerusalem, our Lord sent her to a very respectable lady so that she should speak to her confidentially and do this errand to her. The lady would not speak with her unless her confessor were present, and she said she was happy with this. And then, when the lady's confessor had come, the three of them went to a chapel together, and then this creature said with great reverence and many tears, Madam, our Lord Jesus Christ bade me tell you that your husband is in purgatory, and that you shall be saved, but that it will be a long time before you get to heaven. No one wants to hear that other blue, come on. And then the lady was displeased and said her husband was a good man. She didn't believe he was in purgatory. Her confessor sided with this creature and said it might very well be as she said and backed up her words with many holy tales. And then this lady sent her daughter and others of her household with her to the anchorite who was principal confessor to this creature in order that he should give her up or else he would lose her friendship, her, the lady's friendship. The anchorite said to the messengers that he would not forsake this creature for any man on earth or to such persons as, as would inquire of him about her manner of behaving and what he thought of her. He said she was God's own servant and he also said she was the tabernacle of God. And the anchorite said to her to strengthen her in her faith, though God should take from you all tears and conversings, believe nevertheless that God loves you and that you should be sure of heaven for what you have had before. For tears with love are the greatest gift that God may give on earth, and all men that love God ought to thank him for you. There are. Uh, <laughs> she did. She did do a call out post. Um, there are a lot of chapters that are just like, this person said that I'm actually not talking to God, and I'm not great, and she's right, and I'm wrong, but actually... I went and asked a priest, and he said that I was right. And I went and saw an anchorite, and I went and saw the Archbishop of Canterbury. How about that? Um, also, there was a widow who asked this creature to pray for her husband and discover if he had any need of help. He, the, I was going to explain how the widow can ask Marjorie to pray for her husband because the husband is dead and Christians believe in an afterlife, but I'm pretty sure we all knew that. I don't think that was something that actually needed a little gloss on it there. And as this creature prayed for him, she was answered that his soul would be 30 years in purgatory unless he had better friends on earth. Yeah, yeah, we can all hope to leave a legacy like Marjorie's. Uh, she told this to the widow and said, if you give three or four pounds for him in masses and in alms giving to poor folk, you will highly please God and greatly ease the soul. You can see why the Reformation happened. You want to buy your husband's way out of purgatory. The widow took little heed of her words and let it pass. Then this creature went to the anchorite and told him how she had felt. And he said that the feeling was from God and the deed in itself was good, even though the soul had no need of it and advised that it should be fulfilled. Then this creature told this matter to her confessor, in order that he should speak to the widow, and so for a long time this creature heard no more of this matter. Afterwards our Lord Jesus Christ said to this creature, that thing I ordered should be done for the soul is not done. Ask now your confessor. And so she did, and he said it was not done. And she replied, my Lord Jesus Christ told me as much just now. I love that little exchange. Um, she asks her confessor a question. He replies. She says, yeah, I know. Oh, I already know. Your boss told me. Just, uh, just double checking. Uh, and I know I usually read for about an hour, but um, it is very hot. And I am very tired and my back hurts. So uh, we're going to wrap it up there. But we're going to start again with chapter 20.
um, tomorrow. Because tomorrow is Tuesday. Yes, tomorrow will be Tuesday. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> thank you all very much for joining me and Marjorie and finding out some things about medieval England that you may not have known. Um, I apologize for not being <laughs> for, for not being a little bit more together today, but never mind. Um, yeah, thanks very much. I will be back tomorrow at around whatever time it is I'll be around. I don't think my body enjoys the quiet. Official sponsors of the show. Um, yeah, thank you all very much. I will see you tomorrow. And let's hope that it's a little bit cold. <laughs> bye. Bye bye.